a big, big slip or error. <coughs> I failed to introduce my co-host or our co-host, <laughs> Dr. Laura Presley, who is always kind to uh, assist us at the last minute <laughs> at call. <laughs> and uh, if uh, I'll hand it over to you so you can uh, ask uh, Ms. Mary Lee to introduce herself. So, yes, we have uh, the other candidate in um, the at-large play state. Ms. Lee, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, my name is Mary Ellen Petrozinski, and um, I am also an attorney. Uh, although I don't practice, um, I was educated at Lehigh University, um, Delaware Law School, Widener University, um, many years ago now. <laughs> um, most importantly, I've been a mom of two children who have gone through AISD and been the recipients of um, fabulous academic programming, um, musical opportunities, uh, athletic opportunities, art opportunities. Um, and I am extremely grateful for what my family has received from AISD. Um, I've always had a passion for education and education policy. Um, I recently, well not so recently, for the past eight years have been running um, an organization here in Austin that funds educational opportunity for the underserved. Um, through that work I've seen another side of AISD, um, <coughs> so uh, I've had an opportunity to be uh, in just about every school within the district um, and I've learned a lot. Um, my reasons for running are just that. Uh, as a mom, I, I have one perspective. Um, it's full of gratitude. Um, I gained a wealth of experience navigating this large district for two very different children. Um, and then, in the last eight years, I've seen a completely different set of issues and have had the opportunity to help um, bring <coughs> additional funding to those issues. Uh, both from the foundation that I run, uh, collaborative efforts with other foundations, other so alternative sources of revenue for the district. Um, uh, I would say that um, my priorities in, in running for this position are several. Um, one is to, to leverage the experience, the diverse experience that I'm talking about, what I've learned. Um, in uh, working on uh, the budget and advisory committee for, for the district. I've learned immense amounts of information about a $1 billion budget. Um, I have uh, many innovative ideas about how to hone that budget, um, innovative ideas about alternative sources of funding other than taxes. Um, I also uh, think that teachers are our number one resource in the district. They bring out the best in our children. And so, um, as a former teacher, I also taught school. <laughs> I'm old, <laughs> done a lot of things. Um, I, uh, I have incredible admiration for those teachers, and I think we owe them um, uh, the strongest resources we can bring them. Um, at the same time, we need to ha hold them accountable um, and, and look for innovative ways around high stakes testing um, so that we're not putting all the onus on one way of being accountable. Um, let's see, so the other uh, thing that I'm also interested in is the communication uh, policies and procedures of the district and honing them, and I have many ideas on how to do that, uh, to further engage parents and uh, guardians, significant stakeholders, to um, come and make our public schools stronger. Um, and I guess the last of my highest priorities uh, would be um, diverse programming across the district. Um, I will not be part of the divide, ever. I will be part of collaboration and spreading of resources. So. Okay, so well, <coughs> what we're going to do is uh, 
Thank you, uh, Mary Ellen. What we'll do is uh, I'll ask a couple of questions, and then Dr. Presley will ask a couple of questions. Uh, and these are pretty much in general, uh, uh, because you are running in an at-large position, you know, yeah. the, yeah. the issue. Uh, what is your opinion about the district, and I'll use the word farming out to charter schools, the duties that a district has under a public, as a public institution, but farming out those duties and responsibilities to charter schools and specifically IDEA. And the reason I ask that because if it's successful, will this be setting a trend and will this kind of uh, practice be in West Austin? So what's, what's your opinion about that particular practice or? Right, well I, it's a concern that I hear at every forum that I go to, I've been to literally um, in, on this campaign, in this campaign, and I go to something every night. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the concern I hear that you are expressing is one that many Austinites feel. Um, let me start with idea. Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna say that I'm not against all charter schools because they're all different, right? There's all various types of charter schools and um, idea is just one example. Idea could have been the best idea since uh, sliced bread, but I don't think that we know enough about, or we did at the time, um, what idea had to offer to the district. And in fact, we heard after the fact, many, um, we heard some school board members say, well, I didn't know about this and I didn't know about that. Unanswered questions about a very big decision our district made to hand over um, control of a school to a private charter parents and community members had even more questions, um, of course. So, um, so I thought that the process for bringing in that charter was flawed. And actually, I've spoken to many supporters of who were people who were supportive of bringing in IDEA to um, Allen, who will agree at this point that the process moved too fast and it was not um, as inclusive of community concerns and addressing questions like it should have been. And so I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to see that. Um, I think as a community, as a district, we've learned a lesson. I will recognize that there is an urgency to improving our schools, and I understand um, that was um, the interest of the school board members and the superintendent for bringing it in. I respect that, and I don't think anybody has any bad motives or um, will in, in bringing an idea. Um, so, but we can't do it if we don't bring the community along because what has happened with idea is that um, many, many parents whose kids are zoned to, would be otherwise zoned to idea or are zoned to idea, have opted out. And so they voted with their feet, right? They've decided we're gonna go to neighboring schools and as a result, IDEA is going to operate more like a charter, and it's really going to be hard to know whether they're doing a better job than um, a school that is taking those kids within the neighborhood and just educating those kids, because that, that's the difference with most charters. And um, really, I can't think of a charter in Texas that is any different, where it's a, it's a, it's a magnet school. So like the Ann Richards School is a magnet school, and it's bringing in um, the kids whose parents have um, the time and energy um, to find the best option for their child. Now, not every child is blessed with parents who are able to do that. Um, so IDEA and many other charters are, are going to be taking those, those families from <coughs> our public schools. And, um, and so you can't really compare them to a public school that takes all the kids in a neighborhood and educates all those kids um, because that's the duty of the public schools. Okay. <coughs> uh, I'll, I do want to mention because I was part of the uh, <coughs> debate on IDEA or, or the selection of a charter school to perform the mm -hmm. issues at Allen, but I, I do want to mention in, in fairness to IDEA that uh, KIPP uh, there was three or four other charter schools that applied for this contract, and IDEA is the one that won the contract. 
but uh, there were other uh, uh, charters that, that applied. And today it was announced that uh, we have a new Texas Education Commissioner, uh, Mr. Williams. He was the chairman of the uh, Railroad Commission. Your folks, uh, Pokey. My people. Yes. So, but with that, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, Mary Allen, what's your position so on? So, I, I would uh, agree that I am uh, also a fan of high performing options for children, right? Um, I, too, was not at the board table when the decision was made. I don't know what information they had in front of them. But I do know that school started today, and there's a school full of children there. And next year, there'll be different children. This year, it's those children. And it is urgent that it succeeds for those children. Um, and so now that that is the plan, I would do everything in my power to make sure that all schools in AISD succeed. And by the way, AISD is an in-district charter. It's not a private charter. It's an in-district charter. Idea. So it's part of our public school system. Um, so for those children, it needs to succeed. Every kid counts. Um, that would be pretty much my basic view. Um, so I, I'm in favor of high quality options. Now, uh, Gina brings up a very important point that our processes within AISD <coughs> need to be such that we are gaining information from the community before decisions are made. Um, and, I, and I watched uh, the beginnings of some changes along those lines with our single gender school conversation. Um, but it's a process, you know, even in that meeting where people have asked for that, um, you know, we have to be careful that uh, people that aren't being impacted by the decision aren't weighing in more heavily than the neighborhood um, folks that are being impacted. So our, our systems definitely need some fine tuning and honing, um, but I think the idea issue um, definitely shown a light on that um, and so so would it be safe to say that you support in district charter schools no I would support a high performing option which could be an, it could be in district I mean ideally it's us doing the work from day one without any um, but I pref I will support um, accountability and high performing options for all of our children. We need to find a way to get that to all our children. Okay. You wanna Yeah, <laughs> I have a couple of questions and one is more tactical and one is more strategic. So let me go to the tactical one first. My daughter also attended public school here in Austin and she went to McCallum High School and she was at Murkison Middle School and went to Doss Elementary and also Zilker Elementary. So we moved, as a, I was a graduate student, and we moved a lot uh, going from graduate school to, you know, having a real job and having a home. So what was really, really upsetting to me, I, uh, education is very important to me. My child said she, when she was born, there was a stamp on her head that she will go to college. No question about it. There was no discussion. So as she was getting, taking high, uh, very difficult classes in high school, science, you know, her chemistry, her advanced mathematics, her physics, I was appalled at the Austin Independent School District where they would not, they did not have books for her to take home. She graduated in 2003 mm -hmm. and today we're still in that boat. Mm -hmm. I think that is an atrocity. I cannot imagine a school district that cannot manage funds well enough so that students can take books home, your math, your science, your literature. And I don't want to hear the argument that these things are online. Don't even go there, okay? Because you have over 50% of students in high school that can't get online because they don't have computer access. So what are you going to do tactically so that every student in AISD can take their books home? I'll let you answer first. Oh, it's funny you would bring up that situation. I'm very passionate about this. Well. And I had to go purchase. 
at Half Price Books. I for her. That's what I, I did. I did the same for I know. my daughter. So Half Price Books, I bought two chemistry exactly. books, two physics books, exactly, and you know, so that she would have the I information. Exactly. Okay, so it's I'm very unacceptable. Familiar. Period. So I want to know what you're going right. to do about it. Well, I mean, I, that that just comes to me comes back to um, priorities. So I've had that same experience. So mm -hmm. if you think that's not going to be a priority of mine, you're wrong. I, the exact okay. same experience when it, my daughter started at Covington Middle School, my husband and I went up there and realized that she didn't have a book to bring home. Yeah. And yeah. so I went to um, Bergeron Harris, who, who was with the district for years and was the assistant principal at the time. So, you know, what's up with me? And so he said, well, we can get you the book list and you can buy a set of books for your daughter, which I did. Yeah. which I did but but not all parents can do that that's right. and that's a big part of the concern that I have so when I talk about the budget um, intricacies and the priorities that is very much a priority of mine that every child have the tools they need to succeed and certainly the the course book for your course is a tool that you need that's right so, so but what what give me some actions that you can take. So to I want solutions. I know that you recognize it's so a problem. Well, what you, are the solutions? You work with the, the top budget people at the district. I mean, it's a budget issue, yeah. right? And yeah. they've made um, a priority uh, that doesn't agree with most parents. Um, so that's a situation where you know you take that input, and that priority gets changed. Um, it, you know, it, it may look like a simple way to solve the problem. You know, oh, we can have a class set. Remember that, right. that term? Um, but it's not. It is not conducive to learning. And I use the example that a child that, what we're trying to create in AISD is a lifelong learner. A lifelong learner generally likes to read and generally will take the book for the course that they're interested in not just read the course right, right. work for that night, but go to the chapter on rocks or, you know, that's really interesting to him or her and read that on their own and actually do some incredible learning on their own. So uh, the same um, tack that I took with Covington, you know, you're in a diff different position as a single parent, uh, as, a, as one parent in AISD. Um, as a board member, that would be a priority of mine. And those discussions come up. Uh, I mean, the authority of the board is when you're setting the budget. And right. so that would be a priority. Okay. That's okay. Well, so I've not had kids that have gone through high school yet. So this is the first I've heard of that. And part of um, uh, my campaign experience is just listening to people and hearing these problems because I think. Um, that is how we figure out um, how we tackle educating our children is by listening to parents mm -hmm. and their experiences. Um, but what occurs to me is that I have heard um, theories about how books aren't as important anymore and that we can do everything with worksheets and on a computer screen and um, books are somewhat obsolete, which I do not believe. Um, I think that um, just as Mary Ellen referenced, um, we want to create lifelong learners. And, um, and we don't get there by using worksheets to teach to a test. We need um, substance. We need to offer our, our child substance. Um, and so I do believe that um, books are important. I do believe that our kids spend way too much time in front of screens already. And so um, not only is it a problem that not everybody has access to computers, it's a problem that um, we're in front of screens too often and that leads to all sorts of other problems. Um, so it would be a priority for, for me as well um, to make sure that kids have books and, that, um, and the tools they need to, 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 to really learn and enjoy learning. And um, so, like Mary Ellen said, it would be a, 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 a function of budget, but it would also be a function of what are the priorities of the board member? What are board members? What are the policies that are important to board members? And so, um, as a board member, that would be a policy and um, priority for me. Well, to me, it would. It's, it seems you know, this is the first time I've heard that oh, books are not I'm available. You, and it's still today. And you know what? It's still to today. To me, that's like ten years later. Like a carpenter going to work without a hammer. 
You With know. no tool belt. <laughs> or a tool. Yes. <laughs> so mm -hmm. no wonder we have academic uh, issues within AISD and meeting certain bars. And you think the kids are going to tell their parents, I don't have a book to take home? No. Yeah. Right. They're not going to tell them. The and parents it can never be a, a function of means, right? Yes. So if a parent can go and buy the set, you know, that's, that's, right. that's, that's even more of a travesty. Right. Right. It is, it is. That's an indication that something needs exactly. to change. And, and then exactly. enters the, the issue of equity in that's, education. That's it. <coughs> You're missing and, the boat. Exactly. Uh, but if you have another question, I'll I ask, do. Uh, I do. I'll so follow follow, up It with follows it. through with this. Um, I spent 17 years in the semiconductor industry here in Austin as a manager and a technologist. I have patents and papers, and so education is the most important thing to me. I was I grew up in a, a family, a rural town in um, North Texas, and my family was completely uneducated. My father didn't even graduate high school. He was thrown into work. He was a cattle auctioneer at the stockyards. So he was a very smart man. Very had three businesses going at one time. So um, I learned early on how important education is. I didn't want to work as hard as he did. So, you know, in, in the semiconductor industry, I was uh, an engineer and different manager. My last job, I now own my own business. Uh, my last job, was I was the gross margin manager for a networking business. And so I was involved in cutting costs, looking at budgets and prioritizing and making sure efficiencies were there. And so I'd like to, you both to give me what process would you support and would you push for for improvements in efficiencies and so that you can find money in the budget for books, okay? What process would you push for as a school board? Would you answer to, to, to find the money and to improve efficiencies in the, in the district? Well, um, we, we have an auditor, a uh, financial auditor, uh, or a au financial audit that's done in the district, and um, I think um, we could probably engage that process better. We could probably ask more questions. Um, um, mm -hmm. That is not my expertise, but I, we have access to experts in that area who can help us figure those things out. Um, I think that there are, that there are, um, that there's money out there that we are not taking advantage of. For instance, I don't know if you know this, but there is a foundation for the school district, um, which I only learned once I started running for office, um, which is disappointing because it's such an opportunity. We have some real heavy hitters on that um, foundation board. Kevin Cole um, is the president of it. Uh, Elizabeth um, Christian is on that board, uh, former mm -hmm. mayor's wife, people who um, have access to uh, industries and, and other people who care and would make that kind of investment in our schools, but it's it's definitely underutilized, and many people don't even know about it. So I, I think we need to make sure that we are using these other methods of um, getting money for our children, so that we can um, provide them the education that they deserve. Um, and you know, I think we need to ask a lot of questions. So a former school board member told me, you know, we get these reports this big once a week um, from staff about everything we need for the meeting. And the bigger the reports, the farther away you are from the truth. I bet it. Um, so, um, so I think it's important that we um, that we ask a lot of questions to find out. Somebody has proposed to me, and I'm interested in exploring the idea of having an in-house auditor um, so that school board members could um, ask the in-house auditor, you know, I'm, 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 I'm concerned about this area and spending or performance or what have you that we need more um, information about. And, and, and <coughs> an aud a good auditor will pay for itself. So if we had an auditor to review um, to, to review certain issues that are of concern to the board members, uh, we should be able to find more savings. So that's something that I'm not wholeheartedly endorsing right now. I'm very intrigued and interested, and I'm going to learn more about because I share your concern. Okay. So well, so um, like you, I, I have not quite the, the depth of experience you have, but I've been running um, an organization managing a budget 
um, leveraging dollars and looking for alternative sources of revenue for educational programs for the last eight years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm on the alternative um, sources of revenue subcommittee for the school district. Um, I am familiar with the Austin Public Education Fund. It is grossly underutilized. Uh, everyone knows of the Eanes Public Education <coughs> Fund, um, and some Austinites give to the Eanes Public Education <laughs> Fund, um, but they don't know about the Austin Public Education Fund, um, which is another travesty. Um, um, we also, in the uh, last 10 <coughs> years or so, have um, um, a diverse group of many of them high-tech um, professionals who have started education foundations. Um, and it's been a slow process. Shirley Heitzman, who was with the district um, uh, most recently, uh, has been, uh, had been assigned to this um, project of getting more dollars from alternative resources, including high-tech, um, brought into the district. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's one approach, the alternative resources, and the other is um, through, you know, the current auditing process that we have, um, some really sharp professionals that we have working um, in the accounting slash um, uh, CFO kind of area for the, the district. Um, as well as when we talk about developing processes, um, remembering that our teachers and our principals are important resources. So a process by which we are getting information on a regular basis from teachers, principals, <coughs> parents on just this kind of anecdotal information. Um, we don't have that in place right now. So. Mm -hmm. Those would be my... Uh, I do want to mention... Can I go ahead. Sure, sure. So um, there is a, you know, the semiconductor industry in the United States has had to compete with Asia. And we've had to be um, very proficient at cost savings. And there are what I would call best known methods, processes for cost reduction and finding waste. And you touched on it. The... Uh, what we do in the industry is we will get what you call your first level employees, teachers, principals. You get them together in groups and you say, where's the waste? You are on the first level, you know where the waste is, and you're not in the administration, right. so you're not politically astute enough, you know, typically, right. to try to protect where the waste is. Um, so I would propose that the district look into lean business practices. Mm -hmm. It's a concept that's used in the automotive industry. I don't know if you've heard of it, if you've ever yeah, heard of lean. The semiconductor okay, industry. so he would know. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah. So, mm -hmm. it's a concept and it's a process where you get together first level people and you say, you ask them where is the waste? And you get this kind of cursory first level, you know, kind of programs that could be cut. Mm -hmm. the, but as you go the next quarter mm -hmm. or the next six months, you ask them again and they, they're now in the, the process of thinking of cost cutting, savings, and it's a process. It's a process for people to change how they think and to constantly imagine what could we do. I'll give you an example. I've been to the um, Austin Energy uh, Utility Commission. All of their copies, this thick, color, best grade paper you could imagine. Why? Why isn't it black and white on cheap paper, mm -hmm. okay? That mm -hmm. is a culture of spending. All right. So That's once right. you develop these questions and you, right. you get into that process, so I really want to emphasize how important that mm -hmm. process is. It's a process. It's it not. Is. It's something that you develop over time. So That's I just want to. And our that. teachers know how to pinch pennies, right? They do. I mean, and they, they can tell day. you where the That's administration is wasting money, and you need their exactly information. Right. You need their input. That's and right. And That's they're not biased. And, and one they're not, not political. And one. Um, Right. One thing that's interesting about our accountability system, and I think it goes along those same lines, it, is that we have, it's, mil, it's like military style, right? It's like teachers are accountable to the principal, who's accountable to the superintendent, who's accountable to the board. But there's not 
a lot of accountability that flows back down. Mm -hmm. And so teachers, um, teachers see, witness these things and teachers um, are, are front, uh, on the front lines and, and, and have <coughs> good ideas about what needs to be done. And so I think it's important that we rethink our accountability system to make sure that accountability flows back down as well. And I think um, if we had something like that, we could better assess um, waste and um, cost savings as yeah. well. Yeah. You have a comment on that? I think that's the same thing okay. we were saying. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. no. Well, so. having yeah. been a bureaucrat myself for many years, <laughs> I've, I got hung on to the zero budget process. <laughs> uh, process. There's zero budget every year, and we start from scratch. Uh, yeah. It may not be the most efficient, but uh, those yeah, are some of the practices yeah. that. Yeah, you go that, through the process. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I did, did want to mention one thing that this position pays a very, very huge amount of dollars of zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, really? so I do want to commend both of y'all really? for taking. Wow. Uh, you know the op the opportunity to run for a position that's that yeah. pays and uh, consumes a lot of time a lot of time uh, and i want to say that because as a chief of staff for an elected official who did have staff you know i i can it brings back the nightmares of the stacks and stacks that's of right. papers right. every monday at when i would go to the commissioners uh, to the office i'd have a stack this high and then the elected official the commissioner de Leon would for briefings before commissioner's court, he would just say, just give me the bottom line. <laughs> it's all he wants, yeah. That's all I want to know, yes or no. But um, there is a lot of information that flows in and out through, through AISD and, and to speak about the enormous growth that AISD has experienced. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about the extremes, buoy, um, and the other extremes, Eastside Memorial, you know, and this is an at-large position. So my question that I have for y'all is uh, what type of challenges do you see in running in an at-large position uh, in the school district? Um, well, the number one challenge, unfortunately, is money because there are a lot of people to reach and um, though I'm trying, I don't think I'm going to be able to reach everyone by the time uh, November comes around. So. Um, it takes money to reach a lot of people, and uh, that means that fewer that the pool of people who can raise that money it gets smaller. So that's the challenge of uh, running for an at-large position, um, and, and especially in November, since this is the first time it's going to be a November election. Um, you know, that being said, it one of the good things and nice things about it is that you're able to kind of step back and take a, a big, the larger view, take in the big picture of education policy for our city. And so, um, whereas district representatives represent their, the interests of their constituents who vote for them, it is nice to have some people on the board, I think, who are gonna take into account all of it and figure out as a, as a school district, as a city, how do we want to move forward to educate all of Austin's children? So, uh, you know, there are challenges and there are plus, plus there's, there, there, there's opportunities. I would like to see us review um, as a school district, as a community, really ways that we might um, uh, limit the amount of money that it takes to run. Maybe if we can look at some voluntary um, um, restrictions on raising or um, spending. Um, I know that with Citizens United that all gets uh, more difficult to do, but I think it would be worthwhile to look into that because I think it, it, it is a concern. And you know, we don't have enough money to educate our own children, but yet uh, educating children is a big business and there are interests who, um, are willing to spend a lot of money to get at some of our public dollars, uh, so that uh, they can, um, so that uh, they can make a profit off of them. And unfortunately, that's going to be more and more of a problem, and something that we, as citizens and community members, need to try to figure out how we protect our our our, our public schools from that. 
So uh, l let me ask the question just to make sure. Were you concerned, were, was your question about um, the campaigning for the at-large position or the concerns of being an at-large candidate or both? Because to me they're two really separate questions. Yeah, uh, well, we are running at an at-large position. Yeah. The challenges. Right. Uh, uh, the running at, I, yes. I, w I would say, you know, the at-large position was the most attractive to me um, because m my experience base uh, that I alluded to in, in the bio in the intro, mm -hmm. um, it, I'm so um, passionate about uh, the inequity that we have in the district. And you don't really see that in any one small microcosm. You really have to look across the district to see, as you say, Bowie next to Eastside Memorial, just for an example, right? Um, those are the issues I want to think on. Those are the issues I think on every day in, in the work that I do. Um, so there really was no other position on the board that was of interest to me. Um, <coughs> yeah, uh, as far as Gina's uh, comment about the campaign dollars, it pains me to see money at all <laughs> spent on a campaign when I know the use I can put it to in the education system, because that's what I do with money every day. Right. That's what I want to do with it. You know, th this, you know, I liked it. I brought my cards, you saw they were print, uh, made on the copy machine, <laughs> because I don't want to spend, I want to get the word out, but in the least expensive way there is to do right. it. I know that the city, I don't know about AISD, but I know that the, okay, we'll, we'll have a question from our host. From As a matter door. of fact, uh, <laughs> last, Last Monday we had uh, we didn't have our host here because uh, he was uh, I, I, I'll kid it around and said he was on special assignment. The trailer <laughs> park is you know going up there and, right. and, and so he was out there in a special nice. <laughs> special out assignment. of state <laughs> out of state. That's right. Go ahead. For the it, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I was I was gallivanting around anyway. Did I miss y'all's bio at the beginning uh, about how much time have y'all actually spent in the classroom? Well, I was a teacher. So, and then I went to school. So does that count? <laughs> yeah, because I know there's a lot of administrators out there who have never actually been in the classroom. I've mm. never mm. actually question. been an administrator, but I've been a teacher. Well, that wasn't my question. My question was, of course, uh, my party has a, a platform for the state, and a plank in it is the dollars follow the kids, which uh, I was going to ask about why y'all think people are, are opting out of the, the public school for charter schools, which is a public school. And what do y'all think about the voucher system? Our vouchers, period. And that was my question from, uh, uh, yeah, I was out in Colorado, 6,500 feet. Took me a while to uh, acc acclimate. Had that rubber hose stuff, stuff so far up my nose. Now I'm back, so I'm still ratchet. But anyway, I know, I know they can do great on it, but I had to ask that question. That's a good question. Yeah. Well, about I it. So I'll just go sit back down and listen to you. I, th I think we have to pay very close attention to that. I mean, it's gone on for decades, right? You have uh, the charter system is just one way that people opt out of public school. People opt out of public school and go to private school. People vote with their feet all the time. Mm -hmm. And we're putting our head in the sand at any time if we're not paying attention to why they're doing that. And if they're doing it because we're not performing in a school, we've got to address it. I mean, that, that what about the voucher system? Can you go on record on that? Um, I, you know, I haven't given the voucher system much uh, thought since my own children were in school, and I was not a fan in the sense that I, I didn't like to see dollars leaving, leaving the public system uh, in any way. I, I just, I, I think, you know, in a real competitive market, but we're not there yet. You know, there's so many inequities uh, across uh, the different, you, you know, private schools and their funding and how that it, it just brings too much into question and, and it is a possible drain. I mean, that's so um, I agree that um, people are voting with their feet because they're not getting what they want from their public schools. I think what we need to realize is that the only way we're going to figure out what people want from their public schools is by asking them. And that isn't done too frequently. Yeah. And, um, you know, 
we, we don't find out by having forums where um, people get to click the answer yes or no to a question. We find out by really sitting down and having conversations with people about what are the challenges, what do you want, for, what are your hopes and dreams for your child, um, and, and specifics. What can we do um, to make this a better experience for you and your child, for your family? Um, I have visited so many schools where I have heard repeatedly that parents are frustrated because buses aren't picking up their kids um, to bring them to school, that the bus route misses their kids because they're too close to their schools, because it's not within the policy of AISD to pick up their, school, their kids uh, at their apartment complex and bring them to school. I think it's that kind of um, uh, culture of just being rigid, it's, it's the red tape, right? being rigid to what it is that parents and families want and not being responsive that that sends uh, unfortunately many families out of the public schools. So what, what, what position do you have on the vouchers? Oh and vouchers, um, vouchers I think are dangerous because I think they're a drain on our public schools. Okay we have a Republican legislature coming to Austin in January. Uh, like it's November, like no. it's different. From well, <laughs> well, the reason the reason I'm mentioning that is like because, <laughs> like Mr. Williams, the new education commissioner, yeah. is a hundred percent supporter of vouchers. So that's something that we may be facing uh, with this new it's with this legislature that's coming in. Yeah. Yet it's not November. Yet it's not past November. So, you know, we may have a miracle there, and and and. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have more Democrats in there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the, the one thing that I, the next issue I want to go into is because whichever one of you is elected, you will be taking a position or a vote on the single-sex school proposal that's out there by, uh, by Ms. Bratley. And we had her here as a, as a guest to speak about, about that. And, uh, but one of the things that I noticed when I went to the town hall meeting, because as, as LULAC, uh, we kind of responded to the telephone survey that was done in December, mm -hmm. uh, because th this was the second meeting that they had on the issue. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the uh, uh, constituents within Pearson Garcia that are Mexican American or, or, or Hispanics or the new, uh, were in support of the single sex schools because for them, Wearing a uniform is nothing foreign. It's, it's mm -hmm. something that's been done before. And uh, they also, it also has a little kind of like cultural ingredient in there where they feel that for, uh, especially in the middle school age, age rank, which was at 11, 12, and 13 years old, mm -hmm. that's when our kids start spreading their wings out a little bit. So it's very challenging. So wh what's your position on the single sex school and uh, and how would you, not necessarily vote on it, but wh what type of input or what satisfy you to support single-sex school? Um, I think that President Mark Williams had a valid concern when he asked, why is this model better than others for educating our children? Um, and, and, and that's not something that I know the answer to, and I don't think that's something that has been um, expressed by the district. I, I think that we need to be creative and open to ideas that work, but I haven't seen the evidence that, that, is, that sh that's the solution. Um, it could be. It could very well be, but I don't <coughs> know that we're there yet to make that decision. I, I want to acknowledge um, uh, Cheryl Bradley for recognizing, she, I know she's a big believer in it, and, and she senses an urgency uh, that she is responding to, and I honor that. Um, and I want to acknowledge that that just a couple of weeks ago, she understood that we weren't at that point yet, and so put that on hold. I think it's something definitely to explore, but I think before we make what seems to me at this point a leap into single gender schools, 
I think we need to go back to the community again and sit down with parents and teachers and ask them what is it that are the challenges for this school? Why is it that we're not performing um, the way that we should be performing in our schools? Um, and, and, and then from there, craft a solution. And it may be the solution includes single gender schools, but I'm not sure that we have had those conversations yet. Uh, I would go back to my prior statement, which is I am a fan of um, high caliber options within the school district. Um, there is research on single gender schools that some of them perform very well. Um, I did not study enough of the data that came from Cheryl to know um, the nuances of, of, of this plan and whether um, this is one of them. So that's one issue, right? To make sure we have the highest caliber plan and that's what we're rolling out. Um, secondly, I was, I was at the, the second meeting at LBJ High School um, and I, you know, there were myriad of opinions expressed and as you point out, not even everyone there expressing opinions were necessarily people that were going to be impacted by <coughs> the school. So I think that process needs to be honed further um, to make sure that it is what that community is looking for. Um, and then if it is, our responsibility is to offer the highest quality of that model. Can I wait? Sure. Personally, I think it's a huge distraction when your students don't have books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. We all agree. We I'm all serious. Agree. My daughter was um, at Murkison Middle School in seventh grade, and when the summer rolled around, I was asking a lot of questions, and I said, what books did you read this year at seventh grade? And she said, Mom, we didn't read any books. And I was mm -hmm. floored. Murkison Middle School is a <coughs> pretty one good school. Friends. It's a, it's a, you know, this was back in two, you know, in the 90s, late 90s. So I'm sure there's improvements since. But she had not read one book that year in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely unacceptable. So I think the single gender thing is a distraction. I think that if you're not providing books to your students, that's a first principle and if we're not doing that well we're wasting resources and energy and problem solving on something that um, is not a high priority relative to making sure students have books so they can take them home and they can learn and I am you know I'm adamant about this issue and I think the gender thing <coughs> is a distraction personally okay uh we go off at uh, 758, correct? 7.58, Okay, let me make a little small commentary and then we'll go to closing comments from both of y'all. And uh, if you, uh, did we have, do we have information if volunteers want to contribute or yeah, call on? Yeah, how do you get in contact with y'all, find out more about you, how can they help you, stuff like that. Yeah, Websites. okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, my observation in the town hall meeting that I went attended at LBJ uh, was one uh, of where the parents or the people from the community that were there, that belong, that lived in the area, to me, in my interpretation, they were more concerned of why didn't you involve us at the beginning, as opposed to yeah. now, because they were uh, perceiving it as a, it's a done deal, and that goes back to one effort that we tried last year, is to hold a parents empowerment education summit within AISD because what the parents were what I read the parents what they were saying there at that town hall meeting we want to get involved we want to but we want to be able to participate in whatever curriculum is going to be set up and what in whichever manner in our schools because we're the, as the parents we're the ones that are going to be affected the most because if we have to take the child from point A to point B or right. vice versa we're the ones that, mm -hmm. and, and like I told uh, uh, Trustee Bradley and, and some of the meetings that, that we did have, that in order for this to be successful or any program to be successful, the parents have to be the owners of the process. Because if you don't have the parents being owners of the process, man, you're fighting an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. Sad to say, 
That didn't happen at Allen, an idea. Regardless of the opposition, it, 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 it was still done. So I'll, I'll just uh, leave it at that. And then, uh, Mary Allen, if you'll go ahead and, and uh, close and, and uh, again, educate the, uh, the TV audience how they can get a hold of you. Sure. And, so and, uh, um, again, go from there. Uh, I'm Mary Ellen Pechazinski running for uh, AISD School Board Place 8. Um, I bring uh, diverse experience as a mom of two children who, who have uh, gone through this great district, um, as the executive director of an organization that has worked hard to create educational opportunity for the underserved. Um, I've seen two sides of the district, many sides of the district. Um, and I would like an opportunity to give back and serve in this way. Um, if you are interested in learning more about me, I have a website, Mary Ellen for F O R A I S D dot com. Okay. My name is Gina Inahosa, and I am running for place eight, the at large position. Um, I am running because I want to ampli amplify the voices of parents. Um, and community members, just like Gavino said, nobody cares more about uh, the educating our children than parents do, and I think those voices and concerns need to be heard and respected and incorporated, just like you said, from the very beginning to figure out the very complicated um, issues uh, that we have within our district. My background, I'm um, a licensed attorney, I have spent uh, my professional career working on behalf of uh, people uh, in discrimination cases, um, uh, low wage workers, um, uh, working with other advocates and lawyers to um, uh, garner nutritional aid for low income children. So I've spent my, my <coughs> professional career working on behalf of others. Um, but as a mother with a child in uh, an AISD school, I have a personal stake in this. And um, it's important to me that we get it right for my children and for uh, my neighbor's children and the children for the city of Austin. My um, website is ginainohosa.com. And there you can sign up to be a supporter. You can sign up to volunteer or you can um, go there to um, just ask a question. And I ask for your vote in November. Thank you. Is that it? Uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll put that up on the website somewhere. And we do appreciate y'all coming on. Oh, thank you. As we try to, try so to focus on these down ballot races. We're, we're companies. Uh, and we got a bunch more coming up. No show next week, from, right? It's uh, uh, Labor Day. Your, uh, laboratories. Oh, yeah. After that, we got two weeks, we got the cop show coming up. Yes. Oh, yeah, there's right. the sheriff and the chief. Are you serious? Yeah, at all the same right, time, nice. as well as Wayne Vincent. Huh? He's the president, pl uh, police union president. And then we got they Rick need to Red. They need to address the free speech thing of filming them. I see our buddy got arrested again you today, huh? Oh, I'll yeah, come on that yeah. one too, Pokey. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, we, have, we might have an audience <laughs> out there. But anyway, we do right. appreciate y'all coming out. Well, and uh, right. we want to remind you if you have not registered to vote, October the 6th is the voter registration deadline to be able to vote in the presidential election in this particular race. Like Pokey mentioned, we have a full ballot in November. So we sure do. Uh, bring a <laughs> <laughs> Bring your uh, information because you're going to be in that booth for at yeah. least three or, if not more, four or five That's minutes. Right. But it's going to be a while. But Don't get discouraged. But it's important that we go and, and uh, voice it's our seconds. vote. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Paul, thank everybody for watching. I thank these ladies Thanks for, for coming in and talking thank with you. us. Yeah. And we'll be back in two weeks. Later on, folks. Bye bye.